of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So that hymn helped me in college uh, when I took symphonic masterworks. Uh, I could always tell when the Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring, whenever they, I was like, that's the Lord of the Dance. I know that one. So I at least got one right on that test. So, uh, another story from my childhood or uh, young adulthood. I was uh, recently ordained. Uh, I'd been ordained about one year and the bishop approached me and said, Ben, uh, would you be interested uh, in serving as an interim? Because I, I was obligated two years to Kentucky. Uh, at a church whose, whose rector had suddenly left and returned to uh, Colorado. Uh, and because I was wet behind the ears and this was a very established parish, uh, he decided to give me a super intern. Uh, this intern was a gentleman who desired to become an Episcop Episcopalian. He was an ordained minister for about 30 years already. Uh, he had a PhD, he'd written countless books. He was a brilliant scholar. Uh, the only problem with him was that he realized he was a brilliant scholar. Uh, and I think the bishop thought it would, uh, it would provide some humility to him uh, and some much needed guidance to me if they uh, put us together. Uh, the only, uh, it turned out to be a wonderful relationship. I grew a lot. Uh, the only two things is that the senior warden at the time always got it backwards. He'd always be our interim rector, uh, you know, and then his assistant or his intern, Ben Moss, and I was like, it's the other way. The other, it's sort of hard to be the mentor when your intern is signing uh, autographs and uh, book signings at coffee hour. Uh, but what he did teach me, uh, and he was a phenomenal preacher, uh, but the first thing he did every week was figure out why they put the three readings together. Well, it's four, but he'd focus on the three readings, uh, the Old Testament, the, uh, usually the letter, and then the gospel. What was the thread uh, or the movement of God from one to the other? And his sermon, always without notes and always incredibly heady, uh, would connect those dots for people. And it really was particularly helpful to see how they all went together. Uh, and so I'm going to fail at trying to do that today, uh, uh, as he would brilliantly have mastered it. But every time I went to go look at it and sort of carve out my little sermon, it always came back to the thread that ran through all of these different stories. Uh, because there is one, and the surprising part about it is that during the summer, the first lesson isn't really connected to the other two. Uh, we've been telling the whole story of David, so it's been going in kind of chronological order through, uh, through that book of Samuel. Uh, but somehow, this morning, it connects incredibly powerfully, at least, at least that's what I hope to convey to you. Uh, so the first story, remember how we've had David from that ruddy boy that's, that's selected as the next king from, uh, from uh, being a shepherd, uh, not even really one that was brought forward in the presentation of all the sons, uh, but from that uh, humble beginnings, he's had quite a dramatic story from the slaying of Goliath to the fighting of wars to the uh, conflict with Saul uh, to where we find him today as he has been made king of a reunited kingdom. He has grown incredibly large. And he has reunited the kingdom, and Jerusalem is the center of this kingdom. And he decides it's time to bring God back into the heart of the kingdom. It's time to return God to Jerusalem. So he takes the tabernacle and he tells all of his men, he says, let's take the tabernacle with the Holy of Holies and let's take it back to Jerusalem. Let's take it to Jerusalem so that God can be at the center of the kingdom. Uh, and one of the uh, men that, uh, that's obedient to David grabs uh, part of the tabernacle to take it uh, without sort of uh, much thought and he is struck dead. God wanted people to pay particular attention when they approached God. God wanted them to know that they were on hallowed ground and to approach God uh, with a sense of the holiness and majesty of God. Uh, but David was a little intimidated, so he said, why don't we, uh, instead of taking him straight to my house, uh, why don't we take him to a friend's house first for a while? So they took the tabernacle and they uh, went to a neighboring uh, family's house. They put it there, and then after uh, that family was much blessed and honored by God, David said, well, it's time to take him home now. Uh, so uh, they took him home and... Uh, almost a perfect metaphor for what was going on with David's life as he became bigger, as he became more powerful, uh, as he lived in a giant house of cedar, God got smaller. And so he looks out his window and he sees God still in the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, still there. And he says, you know what? God needs a house. God needs a house bigger than my house. 
I think part of what was going on with David is he realized that God was being diminished as he grew, at least in his own life. And he thought, instead of taking all the layers off his life, why don't I just build up God's house so I feel a little better about where I am? So he sets out to do it. And he goes and he tells God, I'm going to build you an enormous house. It's going to be incredible. It's going to make my house pale in comparison. God said, I think you misunderstood. I've never asked you for a grand house. I've asked the people who approach me to honor me, to understand they're on hallowed ground, to prepare themselves. But I've never asked for an enormous house. And he also doesn't really want David to build this house. For two reasons, I think. Uh, one uh, that we get in Chronicles is that uh, because uh, of all of David's military accomplishments, he was also he was a celebrated military hero, uh, and he just sort of felt like uh, that wasn't the person uh, to build his house. Also, I think they thought, he thought that if they build this temple, and David gets to build this temple, it will become the house of David not the house of God. I think both to David, whose ego is growing, whose power is growing, and as we uh, soon learn, will slip up with all of that power, uh, but also to the people. If this is going to be a house of God, it's got to be a house to God. So God says no. And so David uh, doesn't build the house, but he does set aside all of the gold and all the materials and starts doing the design. And so that the the house is being prepared, but it'll be Solomon who ends up building it. Uh, but what I love about the way that God responds is God flips it upside down. I'm going to give you a house. And I love the way that he describes death in there. As, as having uh, done a difficult funeral this week, uh, when he describes uh, laying down with your ancestors. When your journey is done and your days are fulfilled, you may lie with your ancestors. And he tells David, after that, uh, I will continue to bless your family, and I will build you a house. Your family uh, will continue to stretch, and it does with Solomon, who builds God's house, and Christ, who is the fulfillment through that same, through that same branch. But I think it's a beautiful way that God reminds us that it's about how we approach God, not the majesty of God's house. But we did build the temple, and it became a wonderful place for people to pilgrimage and to go and encounter God, but it also became a stumbling block, a place where people had to, uh, had to leave where they were and journey. Uh, they had to uh, figure out how to exchange monies to get in, uh, and it kind of locked God in a box, which might have been kind of what David wanted at that moment, if he really looked deep inside himself, to put God in a box so that he could continue to grow. But then we have the epistle. The epistle starts off with that same idea. People are arguing over who is of God. Who is to receive the grace uh, and the membership of being part of God's community. And Paul reminds us that Christ broke it open. From the tabernacle to the temple, now it's broken even further and all have access. I love that line that all of us have access to God. That that's part of our Christian story. That, that Christ came so that circumcised, uncircumcised, people of all colors, people of all different ethnicities, people of the whole world have access to God. It's been broken open. I love the way Bishop Gulick talks about the trajectory of Scripture. And we see uh, God's uh, uh, widening. And we're all welcomed in. That all would have access. And then he also says that we become the temple. That the most glorious thing that from having a temple that we can uh, pilgrimage to uh, and some can get closer uh, to God than others, we now all become the timbers, the cedar, the framework of the temple of God. We become the body of Christ. Christ's hands and feet to the world. People's access to God comes through our hands and our hearts and our works been opened up. And the gospel continues that even further. It's an interesting gospel in that it's a preamble to three critical stories in our faith that are never told today. If you look at it, it skips over. It has the beginning part, which is, uh, is the beginning to the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, Jesus is uh, hearing all of the wonderful stories about the people that he sent out, the, the disciples, as they come back and they say, Jesus, you wouldn't believe what happened. Everything you said happened, happened. People listened and people were cured and people believed and they wanted to learn more. And he says, let's go. 
We need to retreat and go and, and process what you've been through, what you've learned. Uh, we need to go away. So it goes, and they, they all go in a boat, and they start heading across to be able to be on retreat. And as they get to the other side, people are already there because they've seen them, and they're so captivated that they all go and gather there. Uh, and that's generally where the story of the feeding of the 5,000 starts to take place. They're all there, and uh, Jesus has compassion for them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, and he continues to teach them, and then night falls, and they're hungry. Uh, but we skip over that. And the three stories we skip over are three critical stories to our faith. The feeding of the 5,000, the storm where Jesus walks on water, and then where he calms the wind. Three fantastic stories are cut out so that we get to the second part of the story, the very last part of the chapter, uh, which is when they cross back over. And people are coming from everywhere to try to touch Jesus, to try to bring their broken uh, loved ones to Jesus so that Jesus might be able to cure them, so that they would go to the town, town square hoping that Jesus might show up and that maybe just by touching the hem that they might receive the grace and goodness and healing power of God. So why do we leave out those three critical stories? Because I think the gospel, minus those stories that sometimes distract, is about access to God. Jesus is on retreat. Jesus has taken his friends on retreat, and people have been so desperate for something uh, of God that they fall to the other side, and Jesus doesn't say, we're closed. Come back some other time when we're not on retreat. He has compassion for them. His heart breaks for them, and he opens up the kingdom of God to them, opens up the heart of God to them. Then he goes to the other side, and he meets people where their wounds are. He meets people in the town center. He meets people uh, who, who touch his cloak and are healed. The gospel continues that trajectory of Scripture, the expansiveness of God. That would start it off in the Holy of Holies, where only a, a few of the religious elite were allowed to approach the, 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 the presence of God. To God reaching out finding people where they are, meeting people in their broken places. What a beautiful arc. And we continue that. That's what Paul reminds us. We are now the temple. We are now the body of Christ. We are now God's children. We are now the access way to the love of God. And we have two reminders of what it is to be that. One is we have to take care of ourselves. We have to retreat. You have to have time with God. And two, we can't be too busy for God's children. We have to find people where they're broken and where they need God's love. And we have to reach out. The story's been broken open. God's love could not be contained. But we are the temple. And we need to leave this building to spill out God's love into the world. Amen.